Prince Suleiman Bal was taught by Mintil Aqil, who was a scholar, a woman scholar of Mauritania. Mintil Aqil. Mintil Aqil is the, 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 the teacher of Suleiman Bal, who was the leader of the revolution of Toro Bay, the revolution who, which have as a role the abolition of slavery trade in, in this uh, region. The north of Senegal, and they start the they 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 establish what's called El Mamia. You you see in the word El Mamia, El Imam, a, a power, a, a theocracy, uh, uh, led by Imam. So, so the first mean now of. Islamization is what is called in Mauritania Mahadra. Mahadra is a, a sort of university. But here the process is after the, the decline of trans-Saharian uh, trade, the trans-Saharian trade who, who <coughs> was in this area, the people will go on the to, to our west where they are, the, the Portuguese are here trying to establish a trade. And this, uh, this period is characterized by this nomadization of population which were before uh, in the cities. And the, the, the phenomenon, uh, phenomenon which goes with this is the, this uh, the arise of the Mahadra as the un nomadic university. Why we so we told it nomadic university because every every uh, group of nomad have their own studies in the, what we call now uh, high studies, particularly through women. Women they teach people. Women teach people uh, still. Uh, Till a certain level, when you ha you get the basic, now you can go to what you call mahadra. It is a sort of university, and first time throughout, uh, thanks to pilgrimage, Mauritanian get the references in Arabic and Islamic studies from Egypt and. Uh, countries of North Africa. But after this, they will start their own development of studies and knowledge. And the particularity of Mauritanian is the memorization, the capacity of memorization. They have, they have, uh, they, they, it was a very striking element observed by, by, by all people. Uh, and maybe here I can remember the there was someone, a scholar called Muhammad Lamin, who visited uh, Medin in the <coughs> end of 90, uh, the, the last, uh, in the 18th. Uh, what he memorized as hadith was tremendous, and no one if in Egypt or in Medin could. Uh, be at this level, and uh, they he have been appointed as a teacher of Arabic in Al Azhar, and he has been invited by uh, the Uthman uh, Ottoman Empire to uh, Emperor to come to Istanbul, and he has been invited by Oscar II of Suede to come to Suede. Uh, so he is very, very, uh, the memorization, except me, they are very, very strong. <laughs> so this uh, gives a, a sort of renaissance of Islamic sciences in this region, a certain gold age, whereas the other countries of the world, Arabic and Islamic world, were in a very declining period. And the example of this is the, for the, the poetry. The poetry we know for Arabic poetry has his gold age in the Abbasid period and so on. But 
in the in this century there was uh, in the period decline whereas Mauritania was in in its very peak age in this uh, and it's, it is exception exceptional situation for uh, for the the poetry here so the the mahadra the school the high school the nomadic uh, become so so famous that all people everywhere will come. We have here the example of Ibn Muqdad. Ibn Muqdad is a, a scholar of Senegal, but m he studied in Mauritania, and all his sons also will study in Mauritania, who will be very brilliant and will play a very great role in uh, the colonization of Mauritania as a, a translator for uh, French colonization. And we have here the, uh, uh, the priest René Voila, who wrote a, 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 a book called uh, Esquisse Senegalaise. In 1853, he told that the death blow that brought the Mohammedans to North Africa sounded beyond the there, and his disciples, the Moors, have left us this gift with his Islam. So he is very uh, disturbed by the presence of Islam in Senegal, and he is, he is pointing out that the responsible of this gift, this Islam is the Moors, so the people of Shingit, the Moorish, the Moors. Uh, Now, the uh, second mean of this Islamization is the trade. We have seen that, mentioned that first, the first Islamization uh, came for, throughout trade, trans-Saharan trade. But he also, first table will say that the Zawaya in the society, Mauritania society, we have a group, two ma major group, the warrior and the scholars. And the scholars are called Zawaya, and you saw Zawaya. And the, the warriors are, are doing the war, but the Zoya are trying to work on knowledge. Their work, their job is knowledge. So this group who has the, the knowledge as speciality is also responsible of trade. So if they practice the trade, they also practice Islamization. And the, in the contemporary uh, period, we can show that in 1920, first, this is the first period of this kind of commerce imposed by the colleges because, because people start to pay in there is monetization. So you should have money to pay taxes. And to have money, you should ha make, you should practice trade. And they start trading, but the, 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 the the interesting element here is the shop, shopkeepers, from boutique. <laughs> so in West Africa, from uh, Togo to Senegal, you will have always in every, in almost every city, you have someone called the shopkeeper, Mauritanian shopkeeper. But this shopkeeper is always the man responsible in general in the neighborhood of teaching people. Quran teaching them, Hadith teaching them, and also sometimes by his exemplarity of his behavior, he attracted people to get in this religion. So the presence of this shopkeeper is very important in the Islamization of, South, uh, of uh, West Africa. We can divide this group between the Eastern Mauritanian uh, group going to Burkina, and to Ivory Coast, and uh, of course having the role of uh, coming with livestock trade. And the other group in the West who are going uh, mostly in Gambia and Guinea. Uh, to finish this, I will just say that now Mahadra, which are in workshop and in other country, continue to attract people from uh, everywhere in the, the world. And also we have every Ramadan, the government sent, sent uh, missionaries in all the region of West Africa. Thank you very much. So, give you a
Yeah. You may, I may need some help to get the, to find these manuscripts on here. Turn this off for now, and I'll, I'll come back. To, we'll, we'll come back to the, the the images that I was hoping that still may po be possible to show. But let me say a few words to tie up um, um, Elamine's comments and 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 begin with um, a, a very uh, familiar point of departure, which is most of us um, in the West and and and. Um, in the Islamic lands have been brought up on wisdom, however subtly imparted to us by Ibn Khaldun and the very notion that the world at base is divided between those who, who know experience are a product of the asabiyah of the blood feelings of rural nomadic society and those who are a product of culture in the cities. That divide permeates a lot of thinking that a lot of us do, and it is a very difficult hurdle to uh, 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 surmount in trying to imagine a, a desert society, a nomadic society, with fairly high levels of Islamic scholarship and with a vibrant intellectual tradition that has uh, been uh, growing over the past 300 years. And this is part of the, the fundamental contradiction, if you will, that is being presented when we even talk about uh, Mauritania. In an effort to, to try to get, get a handle on this, um, I began work uh, a number of years ago, actually the, 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 the database that this began, goes back 20 odd years, uh, after cataloging a private library in a, not a particularly distinguished private library, but an important one in the southern town of Uchilimi, which is located right here. This was a library that um, had been set up, uh, built during the course of the 19th century, not a particularly old library. Um, it had dispersed and uh, the heritor of that uh, literary tradition within that family, a man by the name of Harun Ul Sidi Baba, uh, decided to try to bring together what his grandfather and his father and his great grandfather uh, had in their libraries. And so he went about copying as well as acquiring the manuscripts, again, that had been part of this mid 19th century uh, library. And it was uh, after his death that his family uh, um, extended the privilege to me to come and microfilm uh, to preserve that library. And in the course of preserving that, I tried to develop a finding aid, as they call it in the bibliographic sciences, a, a system that was equally accessible to an Arabic reader who knew very little of the Latin uh, um, alphabet, as well as um, uh, the standard off-the-shelf Orientalist type in the West. We developed a bilingual system that uh, has, is now online, actually. Anybody can access it called the uh, Afri uh, what, let's see, AMMS, African Manuscript Management System. And it began with this particular library, private library in Butilimit, that then was, I had the, a copy of the program that we developed while on a Fulbright myself in, in Mauritania a few years back, and the director of the National Collection of Manuscripts there said, well, why don't we put 
our manuscripts into that same system and then they can be located, can be found, can be compared. That was the beginning of a project, as I say, that dates back about 20, 25 years right now, uh, which now has in it the national collection of Mauritania, this private collection in Butilimit, the national collection in um, Timbuktu, um, a private library up in the north of Mauritania, uh, several libraries in um, Nigeria, uh, the 12, to make a long story short, about 12 libraries from different parts of West Africa, but the dominant number of them and the dominant manuscripts come here from West Africa, uh, from uh, Mauritania. It was with that database um, in mind that uh, uh, one of my students and I recently, within about three years ago, sat down and, and decided to do a fairly mindless exercise, but it was an exercise aimed at trying to get a handle on exactly what El Amin was talking about. If there was such a dramatic and remarkable intellectual tradition in, in, in the West African past, what did it consist of? And, does it hold a candle to any other parts of the Islamic world? And so we, we began an analysis, and it was a really a fingers and toes counting thing, nothing to do with computers except it all was accessible there. How many manuscripts do you see in how many different copies, same title, same author, in how many of these different collections? Um, and uh, to make a long story short, the methodology is pretty dense. Um, we came across about 120 titles written by about 150 authors. All of them, well, I'll talk about what, what they con constitute uh, in a second, but uh, th this body of, of knowledge struck us as being at the very core of what Islamic scholarship was all about across West Africa. It wasn't just stuff that we were finding in Nigeria or just stuff in Mauritania or Timbuktu. It was across the whole of, of West Africa. And we found these 150 authors, 120 works, um, and uh, then started comparing what that core of Islamic learning was all about by comparison to hand lists that we had from Fez hand lists from, uh, from Al-Azhar, hand lists from different parts of the Islamic world in the medieval period and beyond. And uh, lo and behold, and this didn't surprise us, but it might surprise you, the, the core of Islamic learning in places like Shingit, um, in across West Africa, was, uh, had an overlap of about 80 to 90% with what the core of Islamic learning was in any major urban center within the Islamic world um, in the pre-modern times. Well, this itself is reassuring to those of us who have been studying Islam in West Africa all this time. We've not been looking at some kinky uh, 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 corner. We're, we're looking at the mainstream. Uh, but it's also, I think, reassuring to students of Islam to understand the, the oneness, obviously, of this tradition that's being represented in places like um, West Africa. There are some peculiarities as you look at just the Mauritanian literature, and I'll just say a few words about that, um, and then we'll open this to, to questions. One, a point that uh, El Amin has made, um, the role of women in this scholarly tradition in West Africa, in, particularly in Mauritania, uh, is remarkably vibrant. Um, there must be a dozen major female authors, and these are authors of works on Tawhid. These are uh, authors of, of heavy-duty theological and Quranic uh, reflections. And the same women, of course, as Lamine said, who were pre prepping young people coming up through the system for the more advanced studies that was to, were to follow. Um, so the role of women is well documented and is, I think, particularly significant. Um, the um, role of, of verse, Shingit is frequently referred to elsewhere in the Islamic world 
as the land of poets. And I would say of the work that we're cataloging right now for this 300 odd years of Mauritanian scholarly productivity, um, I'll just take a wild guess, 60, 70 percent of it's in verse. Now, that's not by, because these guys just like to, to make verse. It's because verse as a monomic, as, as, a, as a way of memorization, is extremely important. And the, the, the link between memorized text, which means a written text is not, it's like uh, the, the old story about how, how often does a newspaper get read? How often does a text once memorized get heard? Uh, the fact that there's a single manuscript of a particular item is not nearly as important as how many people knew that by heart and were using it and repeating it over and over again across the countryside. Memorization as a, real, as a critical piece of the whole system of, of education in this area, I won't go into some of these arcane details, but uh, suffice it to, to ask yourself how much paper ever got distributed across the Sahara Desert in the 17th century and, and of what quality was it. No, memorization was an extremely important part of a society that was paper, uh, um, uh, not paperless, but paper short uh, in many respects. Um, so the, the, this whole tradition of uh, Mahadras, um, the, 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 the tradition of, of higher education with under the tents, as it were, um, the originality of the uh, scholarship that uh, has emerged. Uh, yes, there were 150 authors, 120 texts that were central. But what's really important and what's really interesting to me as a student of this literature is to see how many hundreds, hundreds of uh, of, of, of commentaries on um, uh, uh, matters of grammar, on matters of, of um, um, uh, Tawheed. Uh, uh, th there are, again, select <laughs> authors that, are, that, that the local authorities go back to time and time again and do greater and greater details of, of commentaries and abbreviations and marginal commentaries that are uh, throughout this literature. I hope at some future date within six months, I'm thinking this project, this five-year project will come to an end. Uh, there may be an opportunity to come and talk just about it to this audience because uh, I think it is a, a remarkable, remarkable feat that um, anywhere in the Islamic world um, would deserve uh, great attention. So the scholarly activity that, that uh, El Amin is talking about and the, the influence of Islam uh, through the Sahara um, is something that, that clearly um, has had profound influence on on Islam across all of, of West Africa. Um, and and the, the proof of this, again, is, is shortly to be published in the form of an exhaustive list of, of local authors and, and their works um, that, uh, uh, thanks to, to El Amin and uh, thanks to Babaka sitting back here, there are a few collaborators on this project in the room with me. Um, all of whom, I mean, all of which sort of adds up to a punchline that I want to deliver on behalf of El Amin because one of the things that he's been writing about recently is, is what happens when Islamism in its modern multiple waves and forms crashes in to a society that does not know secularism, which is what this area is all about. Um, and it's a fascinating story uh, th for those of you who are uh, geographically um, handicapped, as most of us are, uh, this piece of Mali right here is the area known traditionally as the Azawad. And if you're aware of the news stories, it is the is it called Republic of Azawad. The, the Islamist guys are wanting to create. Um, the point is that the what we are seeing unfold right now in places like Mali uh, has been brewing for many years in places like Mauritania where outsiders usually come forward to find or search for a corner of, of the 
society that, that needs reform, and they, what they find is a society that is more heavily Islamized than anything they've ever seen before. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a very interesting kind of political phenomenon, cultural phenomenon today, uh, all a product of this long, many, many century um, tradition of Islamic learning. So with that, Alamina and I will take what questions. I do have some images of some of the manuscripts. I've, I've been trying to talk several museums into doing a, a show, and there will be, we think, here at DePaul, uh, over the next year or two, a show of some of these Mar Mauritanian manuscripts. Um, the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha has promised to do a very major show in 1217. These people think long time in the future. A major show of Islamic uh, manuscripts um, is coming up somewhere in this world, I guess is all I can say. Um, but we do have some images of the, the sorts of things that at least inspired the people in Doha to say, yes, let's do something about this. And if I can f figure out how to get to them, I will we'll put them up here. But meanwhile, let's take questions, if there are any. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just have to find where they are on here. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I was curious about the background of, of the Muslim women scholars. Did they usually come from scholarly families, or would some uh, shopkeeper have a daughter that studies and becomes one of these scholars? How do they come into existence? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the, the education, the, the traditional education system itself it uh, divides, uh, Charles had not enough time to, to explain this, but it divides knowledge about some, some sciences are specialty of women, as the Sira, the hagiography of prophet and so on, and first steps of grammar. They, the system is d done in so way that the first steps are for women, first steps of t But someone did, uh, such as this mental uh, aql, they, they get very, very, very far in studies. But the, the studies is very, the society is open, so all is done co in communitarian system. So if you, someone is starting to teach, all people are listening. And in general, in, in the same tribe, you, you sometimes have People are at the same level in general. They have standard level. Everyone knows it. But for the specialty, you should go to the Mahadra to deepen information. But women, they are, they are, her father, her brother are listening and are teaching. And he, he, she is listening. And she profits from this. What are, what are the complexities of Mauritian society? Is it the, the, um, the, the, Islam, as it emerged there, overlay a Berber social structure that tended to be very matriarchal. And so women from the get-go had a, a parity that they didn't have to struggle to acquire. They were there. And they became, therefore, um, in many cases, uh, uh, you know, I, I shouldn't say that every second scholar is a woman, no. But, no, but they... Right. But, but the, the avenue is open to them, and, and I'll, I'll admit, I'm, I'm surprised as I go through the, these uh, mind-numbing lists of works and, and so, to find how many of them will occasionally refer to so-and-so studied under mint so-and-so, the, 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 you know, the, the uh, particularly woman scholar. I have a second question, may I ask that? Mm. Sure. It, it, the, 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 um, well, I, I mentioned 120 works 
120 authors, 150 works. So there were 30 of those works that were repeat, you know, were, were repeats. Asuyuti shows up yeah. at least three in three different settings, for instance. Uh, who else? I mean, uh, pretty obvious names. Um, but for the most part, they were discrete items. And, and, and one of the interesting things about them is that I'd say about a quarter of these were local authors whose works were repeated. One, one, of, the, one of the important tafsir that was studied in Gutiérrez in, in the 1830s was written by uh, Abdullahi ibn Futi here in northern Nigeria over here, uh, about 20 years before it was being studied there. And that same tafsir I've seen in collections in Fez. Say there are. We think of, of, of a literature flow that comes north to south. Yes. I think it goes south to north. So this was the center was south, spreading out to the east and north. North, yeah. yeah. Well, I should have caught this. So thank you. Okay, to, to, to the to Mauritanians, are Mauritanians aware of their image mm -hmm. in this country? We know here that uh, you know Hamza Yusuf in 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 California. He is the the disciple of one of the famous Mahadra of the center in the, 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 the Asara region called Al and it depends in uh, United States are very very large and. Uh, but uh, people here maybe are aware of this. Uh, this mm -hmm. teach, uh, student of, uh, of, uh, of Georgetown. Yeah, I, I, probably the quick answer to your uh, question, no. I, I don't think most Mauritanians are aware of their, their rep <laughs> um, outside of the country. Uh, that's not to say that they're not a, a very proud people who believe that they may indeed be at the center of the Islamic world, but they're not unique in that notion. I don't think. <coughs> um, I've been curious about something for a while now, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it in this form right here. And what role, if any, um, have the griot in West Africa have played in the spread of Islam throughout West Africa, throughout West Africa particularly the Francophone countries? The griot, what role mm -hmm. have the griots played? Mm -hmm. Very interesting question. Yeah, well, it, yeah, be careful. He he's planning a major article on the musicians <laughs> and, and, and go ahead. But not in this purpose perspective. Anyway, you know, in the Mauritanian society, you have this uh, hierarchy between warriors, scholars, and those cast uh, among them musician. This griot. Uh, what I can say is that the uh, religious music is very important. The, and uh, we have a very popular music called Medh, Medhit Telm, it's Pride of Prophet, Prize of Prophet, specific Prize of Prophet. And, and everyone in Mauritania is always memorizing all the steps of this, the history of Prophet because he always listened to it in the music every night. And uh, but the, the 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 in West Africa, Senegal and Mali particularly, they, the 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 griot have their role is more rather linked to the warriors and to the history of it, history is less less religious than the, that of more so. But I know we should plan to talk about the the, conference, the Muslim Brotherhood, the role, the music of Muslim religious music of Muslim Brotherhood is very important in the in the, in the development of uh, of Islam in West Africa. 
I don't mean to assign me to talk about this, and I, I blew it off. I, let me just say, try to do it real quickly. Uh, the, there is a very long-standing tradition amongst the studies of many of the Islamic sciences up to Salaf, across the Saharan universities. Um, this is not to say there's an infatuation with, with the Turuk, the, the religious orders, the, the Tijaniya, the Qadri. That has come. That is a 19th, late 19th, early 20th century phenomenon that, that's in full bloom at this moment. Traditionally, the literature that, that I'm cataloging, that we're looking at, uh, that come out of this religious uh, literature, um, Tasawwuf is a science to seek God's guidance in a society that, don't forget, is a society that has no state. Can you imagine an environment in which the law is studied, the law is applied, the law is parsed in many different forms and detailed, but this is a law with no state to enforce it. Now that is kind of mind-boggling because we usually think Islamic law and the state, that's all part and parcel of the same thing. One of the great challenges of understanding this whole literary tradition in West Africa is that it is, a, I'd say, 60%, 70% legal literature, and this is legal literature, mainly case law that people develop, and it is through the case law that it, adjudication of difficult issues uh, came up. How do you get the insight? How do you know what it is that is meant in the Sharia if there is no state hovering over you saying, this is it, and this is it, and this is it? The tradition in much of the Sahara, and it's not unique to that one society, one area, but the tradition has been to seek um, in the Sawaf, in the study of, of the inner meanings of God's will, the ways in which this law should be understood. So to Sawaf was an extremely important adjunct, if you will, to the whole legal system which itself operated outside of a, a state altogether. That's a phenomenon of great importance for understanding this literature, but it, it, it has almost nothing to do with the moment when the French in particular, but then the British as well, came in to colonize these areas, were scared uh, silly that the, because of experience elsewhere in their empires that, that, that uh, the Sufi brotherhoods were going to somehow be an organizing force against them started doing all kinds of intelligence gathering about the Sufi sheikhs and what did they do and how often did they meet and so forth and so on, which in effect empowered these guys who didn't have a lot of power by themselves um, and catapulted the whole idea of the brotherhoods, the turuk, the, the, the Sufism in the form that we frequently think of it today, uh, I, I, I call it the commodification of Tasawaf, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the application in a very concrete form of, of this uh, Islamic science. And today, in places like Mauritania and Senegal and Nigeria, right, right across West Africa, the, the Sufi brotherhoods are synonymous with, with Sufism, synonymous with Islam in many areas for that matter. Um, so, dramatic things have happened in the last 100, 150 years, um, and one piece of that dramatic stuff that's happened is the musics that those brotherhoods have taken on and, 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 and uh, um, under whose uh, umbrella uh, musical applications, if you will, of, of religious ideas have taken form. And is that Kind of, and it's a very rich topic. Hi, <coughs> thank you again. Thank you very much for your both of your joint presentation. Um, my question is first, I guess, foremost for Sidi Um At the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned a vignette where you went to Badu um, Sebuli's restaurant on Howard, and uh, the owner of the restaurant mentioned, you know, because you're more you pray for me. 
have something. Um, you know, I guess pointing to that that culture, that understanding from the other culture, you know, the other <coughs> African culture, uh, African Muslim cultures, specifically Senegal and even uh, like said, Nigeria and Guinea, who have had these relationships, you know, whether through trade and also through Islamic learning with Mauritanian scholars who are visiting. What would you say is also not just, you know, what would you say is the relationship um, on a, I guess on a, on a um, like an exoteric Islamic learning level, but also an esoteric Islamic learning level, where they're treating the, where they treat Mauritanians as though they are their sheikhs and the outward and inward, in, in outward and inward sciences. Also, I guess, tying to uh, Dr. Steele's um, statement earlier, that Senegalese and other, and other, I guess, uh, Black, Af Black African Muslims are looking to more, we're looking to more dependent as like the pillars of of, of, um, of Islamic learning and spiritual guidance as well. Did, did I get it very well? So in brief, Mark, the question, the quick version. Yeah, I had a question about uh, one often hears of Timbuktu as a center of learning, of Islamic learning in West Africa. Thank you. Uh, one often hears of uh, Timbuktu as a center of Islamic learning in West Africa, and I'm wondering about the relationship between Mauritania uh, and Timbuktu. Okay. Uh, first table, the, the Timbuktu region is, uh, is uh, socially linked to Mauritanian region. And the famous scholars of Timbuktu were coming from Shingit itself as city. This, this, this very city here called Shingit in Agra and Mauritania, the mountain region, has given the name to all this country after peregrinous or very, or very important scholars of this, this city. And it gives the name uh, to all the country. But people of Shingit also uh, have been established in, 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 in Tumbuktu. And there is no difference, very great difference between the, the two sciences, the two regions. I talk socially, in the social, uh, as social groups. Uh, uh, but Timbuktu, uh, as a trade center, uh, benefits for papers. The problem of paper was not in uh, yeah. Shingit. And the manuscript there has their own history, which is very interesting. Uh, let, let me add, just complicate things a little. This, the, the Arabic spoken here, here's an authority on it, I shouldn't be saying. But the Arabic spoken in this area is called, is known as Hasniya. And the Hasmiya, this, this, these volumes I'm putting here right now, uh, are, are volumes of the Hasmiya phone world. Okay, Hasmiya phone world starts over here in what is 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 the Western Sahara, sweeps through southern Morocco, through the Aswad to Timbuktu and across the Atlantic. All of this is culturally part of the same. Man, well, it's certainly part of the same manuscript culture, but part of the same uh, culture of, of learning as well. And so, uh, Timbuktu is an integral part of it. In fact, I, I've been trying to find a delicate way of putting this to some of my colleagues who think that Timbuktu is the center of it all. Timbuktu is is a is a minor blemish on the face of the Hasidic world, and it sits off here. Why do you call it blemish? Well, I, I, I'm trying to joke about the fact that in so many people's minds, too much, too much, too much, too much. It's a legend. And in fact, it is important, very important. But this is what's important. And Timbuktu is just a reflection of what was centrally in, in the, 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 the Mauritanian story. Yes. Absolutely, the scholars of Timbuktu would disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yes, they would. And then there's two different ethnic groups. So you can't really say, for example, that the um, that Timbuktu is a reflection of the Shinkiti. For example, Afrofamba is not a, not Mauritanian, and he's one of the greatest scholars from. 
احمد بابا احمد بابا But Ahmed Baba is Sif's family is called Aqit, and people of Aqit are coming, yes, following the source, are coming from this region. But anyway, this country, as he told you, is globally a Hassanian people talking the same language, having the same social system, and always the same educational system. That's simply not true. You have a full of people. Who? The poor. The Of course, of course, of course. Even people of the of Timbuktu, at certain point, they cannot talk Hassania. They cannot talk Hassania. I fully. And as he told you, you can have a very great scholar in this region. For example, Sheikh Musa Kamara. Sheikh Musa Kamara, who is a Sunnite personage, he is. One of the greatest scholars, and uh, but uh, we are talking about this region here, this region of Hassanian. It, it is uh, the Tumuktu traditionally belongs to this region, and yeah. we, we say make, that hmm? we have to make a distinction because, for example, throughout the centuries, they've always made maintained that no scholarship has come from Black Africa. All the scholarship has come from so-called Arabs, Arabic-speaking Africa, which is Hasmonea. So, if you're going to say, for example, that Tubakil is a blessing <coughs> as far as Shinkiti is concerned, it's a mismatch of this, this whole form of racism that we've heard time and time again. Well, you know, maybe I can clarify something. Tubakil is, is a part of that Hasmonea from the world. and what makes it so fascinating why it has a, a high rip that it has, is also a part of the northern Nigerian uh, uh, Arabic speaking world, part of the Saniki uh, speaking world. Timbuktu is fascinating because it's a, it's a meeting point of at least three, if not four, major traditions of Islamic scholarship. However, the majority of the scholars, and then the most important scholars, are, are Fula. They write in Fokude, and then they write in Hausa, and in Arabic as well. So they're not Arabs. This is one of the reasons we're putting these catalogs together so we can get a measure of that. Even people of Mauritania are not Arab. All this is very relative anyway. <laughs> and they are not white or so. They are. All this is very good. There's an assertion that you know, there's, there's a separation of races and everything. There's something that was put there in the novel that was introduced by the, by the colonial, um, colonial forces and influence like the French. We try to differentiate between the, the, the Mani Hassan Blacks who were, you know, were seen as the inferior ones coming from Senegal and were actually and ethnically uh, Shinkati or more than because most of them were my color, most of them were the color of the government. And that was considered black still. It wasn't those the lighter ones, those were people who were the lighter ones that were trying to give try to give them more uh, more stock and that was something that was the phenomenon. So to say that you know that's it, you know, this assertion that uh, Dr. Stewart is making is to take away from the from the stock and the um, and the understanding that Black Africa does have, you know, does have its own loci of, of the sun of learning and understanding and, and legacy is, you know, is a, a misnomer because though all of these areas that we're talking about, even from the 14th, 15th century, are still, you know, for all intents and purposes, black. They're all still in terms of Sub-Saharan. Right, and someone's going to say that, for example, that Timbuktu or Sankara University is just a blemish on the, it was just a, main, a minor blemish as far as the is concerned. This, this, this is uh, inappropriate, actually. Well, I, I, let me accept, I, I accept your, your critique and, and, and withdraw that silly uh, notion. What I was, again, trying to convey was that we have sometimes focused on Timbuktu to the exclusion of the multiple different Islamic societies that have funneled into and made Timbuktu, given it the reputation that so richly deserves as, as a centerpiece. But from the point of view of the Hassaniya phone literature, the centerpiece of Shingi itself does need to be reassessed, perhaps. So it's a good point, a very good point. All right, thank you very much.
question.